Welcome everyone. I see we have some attendees filtering into the Zoom. We'll get started in just a few moments. In the latest edition of our NDI Tech Summer Series, today's session will be focused on cybersecurity, on keeping organizations safe in a dangerous digital world. My name is Evan Summers. I'm the Cybersecurity Program Manager at NDI, um, and I'm excited to be joined today uh, by two guests um, from Microsoft, uh, Ginny Badanis and Dave Leichman. Hey, everyone. Dave, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. Hello. And we'll give it just a moment for folks to filter in. I realize we just opened the Zoom. And then we'll dive right in with our conversation. Um, one thing I do want to emphasize today um, is uh, that this conversation is meant to be informal. Um, so uh, please do uh, feel free to ask us any questions um, if you'd like uh, by interacting in the chat. Um, if you uh, are unfamiliar with Zoom or haven't used Zoom before, um, you can send your questions either to uh, just us, to all panelists, or you can select all panelists and attendees. Um, and we'd encourage you to send your questions to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your questions. Um, so when you do send in your questions, please do uh, like Noor just did in the, um, in the chat right there, uh, select all panelists and attendees. Um, actually, I think Noor just sent it to just the panelists. <laughs> uh, but um, if you can, uh, send, select all panelists and attendees um, so that everyone can see uh, the message. Uh, so. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started uh, now that folks have started to trickle in. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, and once again, welcome to the latest edition of our Tech Summer Series. Uh, once again, I'm Evan Summers, the Cybersecurity Program Manager at NDI. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you all um, and to be joined by our two incredible guests to talk about keeping organizations and particularly uh, political parties and campaigns uh, safe in a dangerous digital world. Um, so for those joining today who might not be familiar with NDI, um, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, that works in partnership around the world in 50 plus countries to strengthen and safeguard democratic institutions, processes, and norms to uh, secure a better quality of life for all. That's our mission. Um, an increasingly large and essential part of this mission connects to the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, for years, our team, the Democracy and Technology team, has provided trainings, developed resources, and given other direct technical support to partners, including political parties and campaigns around the world uh, facing cybersecurity challenges. And we, as I'm sure many of you um, have experienced as well, have only seen the needs um, in this space intensify recently. Um, so in particular today, um, Ginny, Dave, and I, um, our conversation is going to focus uh, around uh, three main ideas, three sort of big topics. Um, the first, which is, maybe uh, an obvious um, idea, but I think important to point out, um, is that democratic actors, political parties and campaigns included, are facing increasingly complex cyber threats. Um, the second is that while it's important to acknowledge that awareness of cybersecurity is increasing, we see cybersecurity in the news on an almost daily basis now, there is still a lot of work to do in this space and a lot of room for improvement. 
unfortunately, it's still the case that a lot of the organizations that Dave and Ginny work with and that we at NDI work with uh, don't see themselves as targets until it's too late. And lastly, uh, while well, cybersecurity assistance and materials that are tailored to help individuals is really important and essential, there is a gap um, in content that's tailored to help political parties and other institutions address threats at a more holistic and organizational level. So to talk about these big ideas and the challenges that they present, um, I'm really excited to be joined by uh, Ginny uh, Badanis, whose name I could very well be pronouncing incorrectly, so my apologies, Ginny, <laughs> um, who is the director of the Democracy Forward Initiative at Microsoft. Um, among many other uh, wonderful things on her, her uh, extensive resume. Um, Dave Leichman, the Director of Strategy at the Democracy Forward Initiative. Um, and we were also going to be joined um, this morning by Violeta Vida, the Resident uh, Senior Program Manager in our NDI Hungary office. Unfortunately, Violeta was unable to make it this morning. She uh, had a medical emergency, so we're, we're sending our best to Violeta. Um, but uh, we'll carry on without her this morning. So, um, Ginny, um, if I uh, could start with you first, please correct my, my mispronunciation. <laughs> um, and also, um, could you explain to folks um, on the call, A, um, what's, what's your team do? Why is Microsoft, why does Microsoft care about cybersecurity? Um, I'm sure some folks might be wondering that. Um, why do they care about political parties and cybersecurity around the world? And what are some of the, the biggest threats that you all see parties and campaigns facing right now? Thanks, Evan. Um, it's Ginny Badanes. Badana sounds way cooler, um, but it's just Badanes. <laughs> well, take, take whatever you can. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to you, Evan, and to NDI for um, hosting us here today, but also for the ongoing partnership that we have. Um, you all do some really, really great work. You've been awesome partners and we're excited to, to continue that, including with today's conversation. Um, as far as why Microsoft does this, what exactly is it that we're doing with the Democracy Forward Initiative? The initiative was really born out of um, a lot of what we saw in 2016. And obviously that's a lot of what was happening in the US, but you know, we recognize that cyber threats against political parties and campaigns didn't start in 2016 in the US. Um, but it was really a bit of a sort of awakening moment for a lot of people in the U.S. and in the world generally about the fact that these attacks against democratic institutions, particularly by nation states, were increasing and getting bolder, not just bolder in the frequency and in the um, in the volume, but also bolder in the tactics. And, and so it brought a question into Microsoft leadership of, what is the obligation of the technology industry when it comes to what we're seeing? Um, you know, for a while, I think there was a tendency to sort of focus on customers and um, and maintain our cybersecurity practices with them, which is a great approach that we continue. Um, but I think there was awareness that this is a bigger issue um, and it does impact Microsoft and the other tech companies, uh, whether we wanted to admit it earlier on or not, it did, it impacted us. And that's because Microsoft and similar tech platforms are now the battlefield upon which these um, fights are happening. They're happening on our infrastructure, happening on our products. And, and so whether we wanna be stakeholders in this or not, we are. And so there was a little bit of an awareness uh, awakening. I, again, I'll say at that moment that there was more that a company like Microsoft should be doing in this space beyond what we had been doing at, the, at that point. Um, and then the idea of this program came together and some of us came from a program within Microsoft previously where we'd been working with political campaigns. So that's actually the background that both Dave and I have. And so that brought with it ex expertise and awareness of what that environment is like. And one of the first things that we noted was this is an asymmetric threat. Political parties, political campaigns around the world, um, including in the US are really outmatched when it comes to the adversaries that they are up against. Um, you know, there's sort of a joke that you wouldn't expect a local sheriff to take on the Russian army if they were invading, right? And so here we have these local small IT teams um, who are running political parties and running campaigns expected to take on nation state cyber adversaries. And that is an asymmetric threat. They're not funded to do that. 
they don't have the um, skill set or the tools to do it in most cases. Um, and, and so they really do need support from others, in particular, the companies whose products they're using. And so that was where Microsoft came in. And the big question we asked was, where do we fit in uniquely here to have impact? Um, you know, sure, we could we could give money to a bunch of organizations and, you know, and just call it a day. But we think that we have more to provide. That is certainly an aspect that we've we've gone down that road as well, because there are there is really great work happening, especially in the NGO world where we want to support that work. But but we also think that Microsoft itself has an ability to have impact. So we take on projects when we think here's an area where we can actually provide unique benefit. An example of that, which I'll really let Dave talk more about, um, or we could just talk about more in conversation, we created a program called Account Guard. And while we started in the US, we're now in, I think, 32 different countries. And that's where we said, if you are part of this, what we're sort of calling critical institution space. So if you are a political party, a campaign, a nonprofit that does work in this space, if you're a think tank, an NGO, um, um, an academic institution that has policy implications, like if you are one of these Oh, and also the, the vendors that support them, these small companies that support these organizations. If you're one of those folks, you're in this category of being outsized against your opponent. Um, and if you're using our products, it's not a sales technique, but if you are currently using our products, we want to come in and, and be supportive. And so we have folks sign up for our account guard program where we then help them um, connect with sort of our threat intelligence teams and and we do some work around nation state notifications and support and that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of projects we look to identify is like where, where are, are our products being used where we can help shore them up and protect them. And in particular, when we're talking about political organizations and campaigns. As far as the threats that folks are seeing, we're also constantly uh, reevaluating the threat landscape. So the threats that we deemed most uh, threatening, <laughs> most problematic in, let's say, 2017, it's different today, um, given what we've seen over the last three years, four years. Um, we recognize that we're dealing with some hybrid threats now around disinformation and misinformation combined with cyber activity. Um, it is not it is not just a nation state threat anymore. There are domestic actors. There are um, there are unknown actors, uh, hard to assess. And so we're reevaluating ourselves what the threats are and trying to adjust our programs and services. So right now, I'd say maybe the biggest threat is what I was just referencing, this combination of a, of a cyber attack, but that leads to a mis- and disinformation campaign that really culminates in something that is hard to wrap your arms around, especially if you're a small political party um, trying, to, trying to take that on. So those are those are what we're looking at right now, but looking forward to this conversation and we're always open to feedback on other areas that we should be uh, focusing. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Jenny. Dave, um, what, anything you'd like to add on that or, um, you know, from from your perspective as well, working, um, you know, at Microsoft and also your your background um, for those who aren't aware, Dave uh, and Jenny both have an extensive background working on uh, U.S.-based campaigns and parties. Um, interested in in your perspective on on the threats. Um, obviously, we we have a perspective at NDI working directly with folks um, around the world. But um, interested in in what you've seen in your work um, around the threats, but also sort of the attitudes towards cybersecurity and and how those attitudes. Um, uh, have maybe shifted or or haven't shifted over the past few years um, in, in your all's work um, uh, over the past, you know, four, five, six, however many number of years. Sure. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Dave Legman, the Democracy Forward team. Um, I, I think attitudes have evolved uh, significantly and positively in the last five years. Um, the, if you, I, I remember back to a conversation I had with somebody at the, um, at the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia in 2016. And I said, you know, I think this is gonna be a big deal. I think this is gonna be, uh, cybersecurity is gonna end up being 50% of our work. And they said, ah, I don't know, <laughs> I think it'll blow over. Clearly, it did not blow over, right? Um, and, and in fact, cybersecurity ended up being probably more like 80% of our work rather than 50. Um, but 
the attitudes in among political parties, especially in the US, have shifted from it can't happen here or a willful uh, <laughs> a willful ignorance of it didn't happen here to um, an organizational awareness and an individual awareness that it's really heartening to see. I mean, if you look at the the both the um, national parties and the presidential campaigns in 2020, um, they all had cyber aware onboarding policies. They all had um, best practice cybersecurity in place for um, employees. You know, things like forcing two factor authentication, active uh, management of devices from above, um, forcing folks to use password managers, things like that. Like, that's something that the conversation had just started around in 2016, 2017. And one cycle later in 2020, you already had it as a standard matter of course, at least at the national level. Um, still taking a little bit to get down to the lower levels, as, as you guys know. Like, Cybersecurity is difficult, probably more difficult than it should be. I want to um, give credit to the Democratic Party's former um, chief security officer, Bob Lord, who came from uh, from Twitter, for pushing the space, um, but positively, I, and I'm not saying that in a partisan way, I'm saying like pushing the space towards security by default. Um, he was very critical of some of the tech companies, probably rightly so, for um, making it a little too hard to implement cybersecurity best practices. And that led um, all the companies, I think, to um, change their interfaces in a positive way to make it easier. We have a product um, that's available in US and Canada right now, uh, which is called, um, so M M365 is our email suite, right? Our productivity suite. We have M365 for campaigns, which we offer at our nonprofit price and which has what I'll call an easy button built in, right? You click, it's got like four buttons that you click to implement cybersecurity best practices. That's something I wouldn't have dreamed of, you know, being available even four years ago. And so widely successful that Microsoft actually ended up integrating it into all of their product base uh, for M365. So this uh, notion of security by default has come a long way just in the last two or three years. And it's, it's absolutely just amazing to see the shift. Um, I'll say the only worrying thing that I've, I've seen is attitudes. There's still attitudes of it can't happen here. And I think the, the, the hubris is toward nation state attack, right? Oh, well, you know, nations, I'm, I'm not important enough to be attacked by a nation state. That's absolutely true. But you, by virtue of being online, are a target of financial crime and ransomware, right? Because that is the predominant threat these days. Um, yes, NDI and others in the space and, you know, some of the people on this call probably are targets of, of nation states um, simply by the virtue of the work you do. But as cybersecurity best practices have evolved and um, organizations have responsibly implemented them, we've actually seen nation states turn their attention away from targets that are harder to hit um, like the national parties. I mean, we, we've seen them target think tanks and nonprofits more, uh, call it lowest hanging fruit, right? Um, the return on investment is, uh, is higher if it takes less effort to, uh, to attack. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll finish by saying organizational and individual cybersecurity awareness go hand in hand, right? Um, I think the, while individual cybersecurity awareness has been bolstered by efforts in the political space in the last few years, uh, organizational cybersecurity awareness starts from the top. You know, it comes from the CEO, it comes from the executive director. It's it's culture. Um, it's on it's baking practices into your onboarding and offboarding. It's uh, you know when you hire new people or or let them go. Um, the like having that cultural awareness and having it baked into your organizational practices is absolutely critical because as we've seen, the favorite tactic of a lot of these folks is to start with the weakest link in the chain, attack lower level staff who may not be implementing best practices and use that to uh, stair step where you work their way up through the organization through attacks. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing, Dave. And uh, fascinating to hear uh, for me and, and I, uh, I assume or, or hope for, for our guests joining 
um, as well the the variety of perspectives you have from from the U.S. perspective and also the the broader global perspective as well. There are so many sort of threads uh, I want to pull on <laughs> to continue through the conversation that you mentioned just there. Um, one thing that that I can kind of touch on that that I know Violetta, you know, had had she been able to join us today, would sort of speak of from our NDI's partner perspective is one of the challenges that that we see um, that I see when working with NDI's partners in this space when it comes to cybersecurity is there's really such a wide range of just focusing on political parties, not even, you know, touching on the range of awareness of our civil society partners or our parliamentary partners or other sorts of organizations that NDI works with, just talking about political parties and campaigns for a moment. Um, such a range of awareness and such a range of attitudes, um, you know, from the fully paranoid of they're out to get me um, to just like you said, I'm not a target. Nobody cares about me. Um, my information is not important. And the different sort of tactics and strategies and materials and approaches that are necessary to try and um, get all those folks <laughs> to do the right things is really a challenge. Um, and one thing that that's, um, you know, one thing we wanna highlight during our session today are, are the materials that we've been, we've been working on over the last few months supported by, by Microsoft uh, among other funders um, to try and, and really um, uh, help organizations, help political parties among others, um, try and address some of not just those individual needs, but some of those organizational um, needs. So you mentioned, Dave, policies. Um, you talked about things like onboarding and the human culture. Um, uh, we've been able through Microsoft support to develop uh, a handful of resources, including um, something that, that we're calling our, our CyberSim experiential learning um, uh, exercise, um, a couple of handbooks and an online course that we'll give a, a sneak peek preview of in just a moment. Um, but I was wondering if, if you could dive, um, and Jenny as well, if you could dive a little bit more in, into detail about some of the challenges of um, kind of institutionalizing some of those best practices. So like, yes, you have a few individuals in the party who know what the best practices are. Um, you, you've got a handful of people scattered through the party who know that they should use two-factor authentication or they know they should use account guard. Um, but how do you get those best practices sort of all the way through. And these materials that we're developing are sort of aimed at um, institutionalization of these best practices. But can you speak a little bit to sort of how challenging <laughs> that is um, and, and what you've seen works and doesn't work in that space? Sure, I mean, to your point, and one of the reasons that we're happy to support your work is um, it's training and handholding, training and handholding, right? Like that's that's what has to happen to create organizational change. Um, and that's, that is what happened with the major political parties in the US in the last few years in a very positive way is training and handholding. I mean, they, these things didn't happen by accident. They didn't happen overnight. And you can't just flood the market with um, UB keys and expect everybody to pick them up and start using them, right? Like that's just not realistic. You have to sit down and show people how to use them. You have to be able to support them when they have problems using them. Um, actually, I should say, for folks who don't know, a YubiKey is a, a physical token that's used for two-factor authentication. So a, a USB device that you either touch to your phone or plug into your, to your laptop. Um, things like that, this is a perfect example, right? And, and, and having, having playbooks out there, awesome training to them, getting people to sit down and like, not just listen, but do practical steps, um, helping them implement these things, I think is, is what's absolutely critical. Um, I, I love that you guys are concentrating on, uh, you know, gamifying it, things like that, or, or just turning it into a simulation that people can, can work with because 
some of this is really dry, right? Some of this is not interesting. But um, the other thing is, I think just institutionalizing it. Look, I'll be totally honest, and you guys are going to think I'm I'm a super nerd in all of this. But like, my kids use LastPass. I've taught Dave, them. Dave, we already thought you were a super nerd. Yeah, I, so I know. Don't, don't I know. Worry about it. But like, my kids know to use unique, long, strong passwords and store them in a password manager, and they know what two-factor authentication is. I mean, that's and and so in. 10 years when they're off of college and, and doing this on their own, like they'll be well protected. And, and if we can get like the sooner you start education, <laughs> the sooner it gets baked into processes, right? And that's, that's critical. Well, to the point about kids, um, one of my favorite stories is when my now eight year old came to me and asked me if I could turn 2FA on, on his Fortnite account. <laughs> and that's a video game if, if y'all aren't familiar. And I, I was like, what, why are you asking me this? And it's because Fortnite had built in a reward for everybody who had turned on 2FA and he didn't know what it was, but he knew he wanted the reward that came with it. And so this idea that like, yes, you might wanna gamify it some, create incentives internally. But what I really think that that comes down to is creating a culture where this is an important thing that everyone focuses on and that starts at the top. So if there's one thing that those of you who are out there right now thinking, how do I make my organization more cyber aware? How do we improve? The first thing I would say to do is to get your leadership on board and have them show by example. Um, I think we've all worked in an organization where we've been told something is important and then we see someone in charge not doing that thing. And then you just, you, you think, well, okay, it's not really important then. They're saying that because they have to say that but they're not doing it, which means they don't actually think it's important. And so I know it's a challenge sometimes because a lot of times the people who are in leadership roles are the ones who are most resistant to using two-factor authentication or using a password manager. And they can be the hardest to get on board with the, with the minor inconveniences or at least perceived inconveniences of using some of these best practices. But if you get that person or those people uh, who, are, who are looked up to and lead an organization on board, and then they push the message down to their team and make sure that it's an, an imperative for everyone. That's when I think you really see the culture change. Then you need you need the playbooks and you need you, know, you need those tools to put in place because uh, culture alone is not enough if you don't have something to actually do with that. But I do think that the most important thing is creating that culture and that starts at the top. And and just to add to that, I think um, you know an awareness that digital assets are assets and are equally as valuable as physical assets. I think that that was one of the things that shocked me the most in 2016 was even people within the DNC in the US, the, the Democratic Party, um, didn't view the Russian infiltration of the, of the DNC's computer systems to be as blatant a violation as say Watergate, right? Where, where folks actually broke into the DNC headquarters and you know, took files out of a file cabinet. Uh, they are equivalent actions, right? <laughs> Breaking into computer systems and messing around in files is equivalent to uh, taking, taking files out of a file cabinet. And, and to this day, to institutionalize that, if you, uh, if you go to the DNC, you can see both the, um, the file cabinet from the Watergate break-in and the the server from uh, the <laughs> the Russian infiltration, um, and and that's that's intentional, right? To show that they they were equivalent actions, and and I think that as attitudes shift, and they have shifted significantly in the last five years, I think people have started to realize, yes, you know, um, breaking in and stealing my data is just as bad as breaking in and stealing something out of a file cabinet, um, and, and and that attitude is is critical, is recognizing that digital assets are you know, of equal importance as physical assets, especially in today's age. So Dave, you're, what I've taken away from this is you're taking us on a field trip to see the DNC server. Is that it's it? super unimpressive. <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, I, if, if I can, can also just echo what uh, Jenny, both you and Dave have said about the importance of having leadership buy-in. I, I think, you know, NDI, um, in our work working with political parties um, through through the um, uh, the, uh, the the cyber sim materials that the, you have helped us support um, Dave and, and Jenny and, and through other materials as well 
they're they're really important and great to have. Um, and you know, there are many parties that 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 I and my colleagues have worked with that have a really enthusiastic uh, IT support person, um, or a, a cybersecurity lead, or someone who might not necessarily be a, a coding whiz or a tech, you know, expert but they have the passion and the interest to do the work. Um, and they get 75% of the way there, but they run up against the wall when, just like you were saying, Jenny, they do all the right things, but then they realize the party director or the leader of the party doesn't want to put two-factor authentication in place on their account. And so then everything sort of starts to fall off. <laughs> And it, it's just so important to have that buy-in along with that culture, along with the supporting material. So just a, a, a massive plus one um, to what you both have said. Um, I just noticed I did miss a question in the chat from Noor. Um, and I want to encourage once again, everyone, if you do have questions for, um, for me, Dave or Jenny, to please uh, feel free to add them in the chat at, at any point. Um, Noor asks, and I think this goes back a little bit to what you were mentioning, Dave, perhaps. Um, and Noor, please feel free to clarify if I'm, I'm missing the, the sort of context here. Um, how to build trust between software developers who are confronted to hacking and the users who are also threatened by the misuse of their personal data. Um, so perhaps um, sort of the gist of the question is um, how to build trust between people developing tools and um, users who are concerned about how their data might be used by those technologies. I hope I'm getting that question right here. That's a really important question. And I mean, it's one that we've seen. Uh, I, Evan, you'll remember when we went to India um, and talked to the political parties there, um, one of our main recommendations, I mean, it comes to like, and I will say this, this isn't a sales motion. I'm not like, Ginny and I don't get incentivized to sell anything, to market anything. So. Um, one of our main recommendations is to use cloud-based email. I mean, look, this is like, uh, I'll, I'll call it the feudal equivalent of, we have a castle over here and you're living outside the castle and we're inviting you to come into the castle because we can do a better job protecting you than you can. Um, and there's just a lot of people who still don't trust the castle, right? They think, uh, but the, the feudal master there in the castle is going to um, exert control over my data. Hey, I get that attitude. It's totally fair, and, and uh, it's it's especially more prevalent, I think, in non um, non Western uh, countries and and attitudes, especially those countries who have been um, perhaps trodden on by Western democracies in the past. Um, totally get it. And there's a there's kind of a move lately towards uh, what I'll call sovereign cloud, which is the notion that you know it's popular among a lot of European states, which is uh, Things can live in the cloud, but the cloud boundaries have to end at the borders of, of the country, right? That the, the cloud has to live entirely inside the, the country. Again, perfectly reasonable attitude and something that we as a tech company, um, we we adjust to, we work with to, with countries like that all the time. Um, it's hard though. It, this is a this is a long-term exercise. And I think, you know, Ginny told you why we do what we do. But we do this in order to build trust, right? We I'll say um, Microsoft is one of the most trusted brands in the in the world. So is Google and so is Apple, right? I, I'm not trying, again, not trying to sell you, but we have to earn that trust and we have to keep that trust. And so the work we do here with NTI, uh, the work we do to bolster democracy around the world is all with an eye towards building trust for that exact reason. Um, we need users to trust us in order to keep them safe. Um, and that is, that's hard and it's an evolving thing and it's a long-term thing, um, but that's that's why we do what we do. And, you know, back to Norris' question, like it, it's it's hard, it's a dance. It's, it's a constant push and pull between, you know, we want to respect your rights. We want to respect, respect privacy. Um, I think the whole notion of end-to-end uh, -end encryption and the debate around it is muddies the waters even further. Like um, how can we keep people safe if we, you know, <laughs> We don't know what they're doing um, with our stuff and, and how can we trust our own users, but how can they trust us to keep their data safe and know that it's private and know that we're not intruding on it, which, you know, at Microsoft, we very proudly do not. Um, and, and so I, 
there's no easy answer to that question other than to say it's an evolving process and that that trust factor is probably what's most important to us. One one thing I'd add just to bring it back to this the topic around protecting campaigns and political parties from cyber attacks is I suspect that there are a lot of staffers and politicians out there who would tell you um, the privacy of their data is not as big of a concern after all of their emails have been hacked and leaked onto the web. Um, and so it, that's also a consideration when you're thinking of your personal information. It's one of the things, you know, going back to how do you get individuals to pay attention and to actually realize they might be a target and do something about their own personal security situation. Um, you know, there are many examples of hacks impacting people individually because their individual emails were published. And, and that's just a violation of privacy beyond anything I think any of us would like to experience. Even when those emails are fairly benign, it's still a, an invasion of your you know, personal space, something that you never expected to be public. Um, and in addition to that, going back to, back to this idea of like cyber, uh, hybrid, hybrid cyber attacks, um, you know, we've seen some cases where false emails are mixed in with real ones in such a way that it is very difficult for you as an individual or as an organization to, um, to claim you know, what is true and what is not. And, and you get into very muddy waters when there are emails that look just like your other ones, which are in fact real, uh, but that one isn't. And, and it's being used against you in the media or against your party or your, or your candidate. So uh, I don't mean to take anything away from the very serious conversation Dave was just having, but I also wanted to highlight, you know, personal data getting hacked and leaked is also a, a concern that if you work in the political process, it should be on your mind as well. For sure. And, and one thing I'll just briefly add from the NDI perspective, when working with, with parties and other organizations as well, um, that issue of can we, should we trust um, a third party organization, a, a cloud hosting provider with our data, a Google, a Microsoft, a, it's often just a Google or Microsoft, you know, a G, a G, a G Suite or Google Workspace or a Microsoft 365 with our data is a very, very common conversation and concern. And the way we often phrase it, we're, we're not, um, Pitch. I mean, you should take David his word, obviously, but um, you know, we are certainly not pitching folks to use Microsoft or Google services. But I think the the feudal analogy you gave Dave is a really good one. I'll, I'll probably steal that. Um, but it's just the case that, particularly for small political parties and campaigns that NDI works with, it's going to take a lot of time, money cost, effort, resources to secure data um, and physical servers at the same level that a Microsoft or a Google can. Um, and even then, if you're hosting a physical server in a country where you might be at risk of a physical office raid or something like that, your data is just not going to be as secure as it's going to be in the cloud. So, but, but there are, are very, um, uh, long detailed conversations that can go into that. But but Noor, your question is a really, really important one and one that definitely comes up in a lot of our conversations with partners when, when it comes to these issues. Um, so I am cognizant of time. Um, we've got just about five minutes left and we did promise a sneak peek of some of our resources. So I do want to get to that. Um, so uh, once again, um, please feel free to, to pop in the chat with any questions, but I am going to actually share my screen. Um, uh, famous last words in a Zoom call um, that I'm going to, to try and share my screen um, and show you all a few uh, resources that we've been developing and some screenshots of some resources that we're about to launch. Um, some of these have been developed as part of a recent program um, that uh, is, has been funded generously by Microsoft. Um, as part of this program, um, NDI has revamped um, our uh, methodology to conduct um, direct uh, assessments and trainings with political parties. We've been doing this, this programming work in, in a, a few different countries um, uh, around the world, um, Hungary, Iraq, um, Morocco, uh, among others. 
um, and we're developing um, a series of cybersecurity handbooks that we'll be launching very soon. One of them focused specifically on political parties and campaigns, another on civil society, or four, I should say, civil society organizations, and uh, another um, focused on uh, parliaments and legislatures. Um, and also as part of that, um, uh, we're going to be uh, launching and sharing with you all today um, an online course um, that will be another way to access the materials. Um, and then also I'm going to just show you um, a brief sort of screenshot of um, the um, sort of in-person gameplay exercise that I mentioned earlier that we developed um, a couple years ago, um, the CyberSim Experiential Learning Exercise um, that is basically a live kind of tabletop game um, that we developed for campaigns to experience what it feels like to go through a cybersecurity attack during the course of a campaign um, and what they have to do to respond to it and recover to it in real time so they can experience it um, in sort of a safe environment, learn from it, and hopefully uh, avoid it and know how to respond to it if it happens in the future. So it's kind of a fun way to prepare for um, and uh, be uh, more resilient towards uh, cyber attacks um, uh, before they happen in, in the real world. So with that said, um, I'm going to share my screen and preview some of this stuff for you all. So first, I'm going to drop the link in the chat to this course. So this is the link to the cybersecurity course. Um, it is on our platform, um, our open edX uh, online course platform. Uh, you'll have to sign up for an account in order to take the course. And as you go through the course, you can select whether you're a um, civil society organization participant or a political party participant. Um, and this, if you can see my screen, is what the sort of homepage of the course will look like. Um, so if you're interested in it, um, you can land on the screen and enroll in the course if you are interested. And just to give you a little bit of a view of what the course looks like, um, uh, it's got the material um, that's the same as what will be in our handbooks that we'll be launching very, very soon, um, but just in a different sort of more interactive format. Um, and the handbook is really based around the idea of helping organizations uh, build cybersecurity plans. So um, it's built around uh, key sections on creating a culture of security, building strong foundations, communication security, staying safe on the internet, all those important things. Um, and at the end of each section, it helps organizations um, create building blocks towards developing an organizational security plan. Um, so, for instance, at the end of the staying safe on the internet section, um, you would get reminded of the key things that um, you would learn in this section and then have the opportunity to start to build out your organizational security plan um, by answering some key questions. So obviously we don't have time for me to go through the whole course with you all today, um, but this is just a little bit of a, a sneak peek and a preview of what it looks like. Um, and then in addition, uh, just to give you all a little bit of a flavor, um, let me share my screen here. Um, this is a little image of a few uh, MDI staff people actually playing the uh, CyberSim um, uh, experiential learning exercise. 
um, a little bit ago. This was in, in pre-COVID times. You can tell no masks are being worn here. Um, but that's an example of what the CyberSim experiential learning exercise looks like. Um, this is a, a preview of what some of these cybersecurity handbooks um, are going to look like. And uh, it will be available very soon in website format as well as a PDF. And this is a quick screenshot, as I just showed you, from the online course. So stay tuned to the NDI Twitter feed. We'll be releasing these materials very, very shortly. Um, but we wanted to give you guys a, a quick sneak peek um, on this call today. So um, Natalia, I see your question. Right now, all the courses are in English only, but they are uh, currently in the process of being translated. So all the materials for the handbook are going to be in uh, NDI's core languages. Um, so that's English, Spanish, French, um, Arabic, and Russian. Um, the timeline on that is um, depends <laughs> on each language, um, but we will have the have all the materials translated in NDI's core languages um, probably over the next few months, um, depending on each language. Um, but very important question um, to, to answer for the group. Um, Dave, Jenny, uh, anything you want to add? Um, and a great other question in the chat. <laughs> Where can we find you for further interaction, discussion, or learning? Um, uh, you can reach out to the NDI Tech team at any time um, by uh, emailing ndi-tech at ndi.org or uh, just connect with us directly on Twitter. Um, you can reach uh, uh, Dave and Ginny at the email they just sent in the chat, msddp at microsoft.com. Um, and we also have an email if you're interested specifically in the cyber handbook materials. Um, that is cyber handbook at ndi.org, which I just added to the chat as well. Um, so we are a little bit over time, um, but once again, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Dave and Ginny, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope the conversation was fruitful um, and we thank everyone for joining. Um, a recording of this will be available online, so please do share uh, and take care and stay safe.